Hi. Uh, I haven't really done a, a workbench video in a long time. Uh, I've been spending all my time on these lengthy narratives, and um, for once, I'm just like, you know, I just got this item in the mail that really just needs to be opened up, cleaned up, given some TLC, uh, and I'm just going to do that. And I'll explain a little bit about it, but I'm not going to spend 45 minutes explaining its history and how it fit into the cultural realities. Of Remember back in my beige whales video, I said that one of my real white whales, the ones I would really put some money and some effort into finding, would be an IBM PS2 Model 25 with a 386. Well, I didn't get one, uh, but I did get something very similar and perhaps even more interesting. Hey Gibbs, you can't be up here. Sorry. Ugh. Ugh. So this here is an IBM EduQuest Model 30, as I understand it. Oh, it actually says 30 right there. I thought I was gonna have to like decode the model number and find some rubric somewhere, some ancient typewritten document that would explain how to know that this was a 30. 30. Gibbs. You can see it's an all-in-one machine. Uh, this is kind of IBM's equivalent of like a G3 Molar Mac or, or one of the other Apple all-in-one machines that they sold to schools. Um, because this one, given the name, EduQuest, is actually intended to be used in school computer labs. I don't know the answer to whether IBM was playing a major role in the computer lab market before uh, the clone market exploded. Like, with the original IBM PCs, I know those did end up in computer labs. I've seen some, some pictures of that, but I don't know how common that was compared to the Apple II and whatnot. This guy was after the clone market exploded. IBMs were being cloned, like, en masse by the mid 80s. I think by 83, 84, you could get all sorts of IBM clones. And you'll see more about that later when I power this up. But this one uh, came out in, I don't know. I need to look it up. Okay, I can't find really hard data, uh, but a number of websites say that this came out in 1993, which seems really late given its specifications, but also it was a thing uh, throughout like the 80s and 90s that PCs didn't really move with the hardware. Um, you could buy PCs using the original 8088 CPU like into the 90s. So like 12 years after the IBM PC came out. And likewise, this thing has a 386 CPU that came out in 1985, um, but it's entirely reasonable that they would make a PC with that like eight years later. So I, I can believe it. Let's see if there's a date code on the back. I didn't even think to check. Well, if there is one, I don't know how to read it. So even a serial number on here? I don't see a serial number tag. Maybe it's on the bottom. Well, the warranty expires uh, in March of 1995. Anyway, it being an all-in-one machine, um, obviously it's got the great big monitor built into it, right? This is bigger than I thought it was going to be. Um, I don't really know how big a Model 25 is. I was picturing it having a monitor about yay big, like a 13, 13 inch, something like that. This, I, I think this is a 15 inch. Um, it's a pretty hefty boy. And, uh, and it is hefty too, like it's, um, it's not like super tippy, but look, I could pull it forward real easy. <laughs> so it's front heavy. There's a lot of weight up here. And if you try to pick it up, you could definitely feel there's like 20 pounds up front, and like 10 pounds in the back. And I think maybe if I'd gotten the Model 25, I would have had a little more room for it. This thing's even bigger than my compact CDS 524, which I have not done a video about yet. So it's, it's big. It's like, I don't think it's G3 like Molar Mac big. Um, I want one of those too, but I think that's even bigger. I think those come up to like here. They're, I've been in front of one of those that they're gigantic. I don't think this one's as big as a Molar Mac, but it's not small. But it's still neat to have an all-in-one machine, right? Because frankly, you can use it to have the original experience without having to drag out a CRT. And you think to yourself, but that's, you're, you're just tricking yourself there. You bought a CRT. This is no different than buying a PC and a CRT. Correct. So this has a uh, pretty normal stuff for 1993. We've got uh, a single floppy drive, 1.4 meg, which has a disc stuck in it. And that disc is actually very special. Uh, it seems to have some of the original software on it, which I definitely want to preserve. So I need to carefully get that disc out, which is why I've not just ripped it out with pliers because I don't want to damage it. So I'm going to have to try and extricate the floppy drive in order to carefully remove that disc so I can image it. Uh, it also has a CD-ROM down here of the Caddy variety. I don't know if you remember those. Um, these were kind of miserable. It was essentially like 
What if you had to put the whole jewel case into the CD-ROM? This is like that. I don't have any caddies, so I can't use this. Now, I could buy a caddy or I could replace the drive with another one that has a normal drawer, but ostensibly this is a SCSI drive. You can get those, but at that point I just don't want to go through the nonsense of trying to find a working SCSI drive from like 1992. So I'll probably just get the CD caddy and see if this one works. Around on the back here, oh by the way, remember these? I think if you didn't go to a school that had computers of this age, you won't remember these. I've only seen them in two places, on computers from the mid 90s and on the Apple II GSs, which I think were also from the early 90s uh, that my school had. Um, this is a mouse holster. I don't know if this was stock or if this screw here is just driven straight into the plastic. I have a mouse, well, a normal mouse fit in there. Eh, kinda. Like it sort of has to stretch it to fit in there and it doesn't look very good. Hopefully I'll be able to get a period authentic mouse that'll fit in there nicely. All right, on the back, uh, things are pretty simple. Here, let me get you in here. All right, power. Uh, it's PS2 era, so I can just use a normal PS2 keyboard and mouse. Um, parallel port, that's all normal. Then, this is interesting. It takes a DB25 serial, not a DE9 serial. IBM was using DE9 on their very first machines, so I don't know why they went with this necessarily. That's kind of weird, especially for 1993. The other odd thing is this port here I don't know what it is, but it's not stock. I suspect that this could be SCSI. I think this machine might have an aftermarket SCSI card in it. And that could actually be quite interesting because I don't have a SCSI card. This guy here could be ethernet. Um, oh my God, there's the sticker. Manufactured August, 1993. There's our answer. Anyway, I think this is probably ethernet. There are a couple other things it could be, but it probably isn't. So that's probably ISA ethernet, which is also a cool thing because I don't think I had any of those. And over here, I don't know what this is. This machine's too new for that to be a graphics card. It also has an FCC sticker on it. I really can't place what that might be. That's, hmm. I'll be interested to open this up and see what that is. Also, there was a sound card you get with this, and it's interesting that they embossed the labels for the sound card as if it were going to be included with every one, but the sound card's not here. I don't know why that would be. That seems odd. I might have the sound card that goes in here, incidentally, from ages ago. It just cropped up somewhere. Then there's the elephant in the room. It's rusty. Ugh, that sucks. A lot of rust here. A uh, little bit of rust elsewhere. Don't know what happened here. Clearly not the best conditions it was kept in, but I have powered it up when I, as soon as I got it. Everything works, so not worried about that. So there are some unfortunate things that could be going on in there, but the important things are everything seems to work. The machine started up and booted off of the floppy drive, and then it was able to access the hard drive. Yes, it has a hard drive, 93. Of course it has a hard drive. Um, the fact the hard drive is working and has the original software on it, it's very exciting. I need to get an image of that. I actually probably shouldn't have turned it on at all, but I figured the seller turned it on and then shipped it. If it didn't get destroyed in transit, it can survive one more power on, uh, and it, it seemed to. So before I can do anything else, I gotta get that hard drive out of there and get a copy of it. But I'm a little concerned because disassembly this thing doesn't look like fun. Um, this here is a drawer. You can apparently take the screws out and just slide this out. Not an uncommon thing uh, on all-in-one machines. Uh, there's mention up here of open drawer slowly to service, but I'm sure that's not gonna get me access to the hard drive. We'll see, maybe it will, but I'm picturing the hard drive being mounted all the way up here in the front. In addition to that, I've gotta pull the floppy drive, which is mounted all the way up in the front. Well, after that comes out, it kind of looks like the whole chassis has got to come off. Not looking forward to that, but hopefully, if I'm lucky, I see two screws here, or covers for two screws. I'm guessing it's just those two, and then maybe these ones, and I'm guessing the, the back will come right off. I'll have to worry about the CRT, of course, but uh, oh well. And of course, while I've got it open, I'll have an opportunity to clean it. Uh, this thing is not incredibly filthy but it's not incredibly clean either. So anyway, um, that's sort of the situation with it. Um, I do know it works. So when it's all done, I'll be able to power it on, play with it a little bit. Uh, otherwise, you know, this is just an opportunity to give you a, a, a shot at seeing this thing before I figure out what story it may have fit into. So let's get started for our first incision. Number two, Phillips screwdriver. Simplest thing to do here, is just pull the motherboard, for which I need a static strap if I'm gonna be responsible. 
Now I'm not sure which screws need to come out. I'm guessing it's these two here and on the other side. By the way, this seems to have a Kensington lock, which uh, I guess those were around in 93, but it is weird to see on a, a desktop PC. I think probably, you know, the other school, school intended computers probably had that as well. So it says open drawer slowly to service. How do I open the drawer? Is there, oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Oh, wow, that's, that's moving a lot more of the machine than I expected. It's, uh, it's the entire base plate. I thought this was a drawer, a, a tray that was floating up about here, but it actually goes all the way to the bottom of the machine. Now, there could be cabling going on here, or it could be like quick disconnects or, or edge connectors or something. I can see a cable starting to go taut here. I'm thinking that's the video cable for the monitor. Yeah, I see red, green, and blue uh, coax wires there. This thing is really heavy. I mean, it's the, it's the whole PC I'm pulling out here, but still, it's really heavy. Okay, I'm pretty positive that this cable here needs to go. Let me see if I can get you a better view of that. Yeah, so this cable right here is going pretty taut. I'm positive that's going up to the monitor driver. There's a, I think, is there, is there a release on here? Or do you just pull on it? Oh, you just pull on it, okay. It is keyed, so you can't get it in wrong. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. So I think it's supposed to stop uh, at these plastic tabs here. Uh, if I push that back in, yeah, it sort of catches over there. They're, they're kind of hinky. Uh, hmm. So there's, I guess, one back here. And if I push on that, okay, there we go. I'll push on this one. Okay. Oh, wow. Hey, hey, there's the hard drive. Whole damn machine just came right out. Okay, I'm gonna have to go investigate over there. There's a plastic tab sticking up over here that looks like it is supposed to be where it is. But when I push on it, it just it just comes right up. I don't know if it's supposed to do that or not. So not sure what that's about. The plastics on this thing seem pretty robust given its age. For 93, this could have been a machine that just falls to pieces when you just glance at it. This is token ring. I'll bet this is a token ring card. D sub, right, right, yeah, that's right. Token ring used nine pin D sub. And you plug a thing that's sort of like an AUI uh, adapter into it. Let me look up uh, this part number here. That is an EduQuest token ring card. Oh, terrific, I finally have token ring. Okay, so we've got the token ring card here. There's an empty ISA slot under it where the sound card could go. This is the floppy drive cable there, which, oh, oh, that's the floppy drive. I was wrong. It does come out with the drawer. I can do the whole service just like this. I don't have to take the chassis off. Yeah, baby. Then there's this cable here that looks like IDE. I'm seeing what looks like a little a little pop-off cover here. I'm guessing that if I slide this off or maybe pull this thing out and turn it over, I'm not sure which, uh, I'm gonna get access to the hard drive right there. So that'll make that part of the uh, service easy. And then there's a SCSI connector over here that, yep, sure enough, is on that card. So that's a a SCSI card for the CD-ROM, but also it's got an external 25 pin. That's useful. All sorts of stuff I could do with that. It's also very cool that this has an IDE hard drive. I was worried that might be SCSI as well. And I should point out, I did read that this machine will only take a 526 megabyte drive, I believe. So I'm not gonna bother upgrading it. But if I wanted to, I could put a 512 meg CF card in there. And I do have those, but I don't think I have, I don't think I have a board. Uh, for adapting it that will fit in here. I'll check. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll switch this thing to uh, a CF card while I'm in here. All right, what other news do we have here? Uh, the memory situation, when I booted it up earlier, I was able to get it all the way into Windows, and it looked like it might actually have 24 megs of memory. Although, wow, um, I guess that would make these, what, eight and 16 meg sticks, which would be pretty impressive. So I don't know if there's more memory on here that I'm not seeing. Let me see if I can get some light on this. There's a, a really unfortunate Thing going on here look at that that uh that timing crystal is all the way off the board is that uh is that loose no it's not loose yeah i can see the lead so it's just uh huh it's just floating manufacturing defect i guess so are there any more cables um anchoring this thing there aren't many 
Oh, I see. Um, so this one here, that's your main power supply cable, it looks like. Uh, it's hard for me to get a shot of that, but it's really easy to take it out. You just uh, just grab it and pull. Let's um, maybe take it out of this little... I'm going to slide this back inside here a little bit. A little more slack on there. She will be able to get it out of the cable clip. Okay, and then this should just come right out. And it's a little tougher than just. There we go. There we go. All right. This one's also keyed. So the uh, tabs here face that way. And now I should be able to free this completely for the rest of the machine. All right, so let's put this guy aside. There it is, that's, that's the EduQuest. That's the whole machine. And if you look at it this way, it is about the size, I think, of a PS2 desktop. So that kind of makes sense. I wonder what is going on over here. Oh, okay, yeah, that's, there's broken plastic under this retaining screw here. I don't know what this was, but uh, it ain't it anymore. Um, the SCSI card here is, this SCSI card here is really, really basic. I wonder, um, I think this might have been custom made. Yep, there we go. Manufactured exclusively for IBM Corp by Future Domain Corp. Never heard of them. There's nothing on there other than a single VLSI chip. That is a very bare bones SCSI card. Anyway, there's our floppy drive. I'll bet it'll just eject now. Oh, hmm. I really didn't expect that. But now that I can just gently get at it without having to use pliers or anything, there we go. NSF local. I'm gonna rip this disc uh, on my Windows 10 laptop here. And the drive I'm gonna use is this Dell one. It's not actually for this Dell laptop. It's for a Dell laptop from several generations earlier. But I highly recommend it. And that seems silly because it really does look like it needs to go in the side of the laptop. Look at that. USB, baby. This thing is a mini USB, not micro USB, uh, USB floppy drive, in addition to having the unique connector for going into a, a like a Dell D620, I think. And uh, it's my favorite USB floppy drive. I've used a few. Um, I can't recommend any other particular brand because they all seem to be just like six letter Chinese garbage. Uh, but this one is very consistent. Um, I'll put the model number down in the description in case you want to look one up. I bought like six of them on eBay because <laughs> with old floppies, the risk is that when you put the disc in the drive, if it's got mold or debris on it, which is not uncommon with old floppy disks, it will actually destroy the drive. And then every disc you put in the drive after that will also be destroyed. It's great fun. So if you're considering doing some uh, floppy disk archiving, make sure that you really have your wits about you because you can actually, instead of preserving a bunch of history, you can completely destroy it. In this case, this drive is brand new, just came out of the new old stock wrapping, so I trust it. I'm also gonna be using WinImage, uh, which is the, the premier Windows floppy imaging program, which I got a license for and then lost, and I can't find it anymore. Another nice thing about this Dell floppy drive, I don't know if it's true for all USB floppy drives, uh, probably is, but it honors the uh, density select window. So this hole here that tells the drive whether it's a 720K or a 1.4 meg disk, um, it'll honor that. So if you put in a really old disk, it will actually get the size correct. Um, although this one actually is 1.4 meg. I think, I think by the late 80s, nobody was using 720K anymore, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, doing this is actually really straightforward. It's not like a you know deeply involved procedure. I'm just gonna put the disk in, go to WinImage and hit read. And I'm seeing files show up. Now, despite the fact the machine booted off this disk, that doesn't necessarily mean the disk is good. I could hit some bad sectors while reading it, and that would be a bummer, but the fact that it at least booted means I can probably get most of the critical files off of it. Though that said, I mean, most of the floppy disks I try to image end up being fine. The only ones I've ever encountered that were actually bad consistently, rather than just the you know, one occasional bad disk out of like a whole pile, uh, were the ones that were stored in really unpleasant conditions. You know, my parents had a bin of disks that had been kicked around for 25 years that actually had like dirt on the box and everything. And those ones had a decent number of bad disks, but otherwise almost every floppy I try to image works. Oh, there it is. Sector not found. Let me go ahead and retry that read. I'm getting a lot of read errors, but then I hit retry and it seems to get through them. It seems to be progressing. Okay, and there we are. Let me go ahead and save this image. 
If you do this yourself, um, you want to make sure you save it just as an IMA file. There's nothing wrong with IMZ files, except they don't make them small enough to be worth it on the modern internet, and they're irritating. All right, and now we have an image, and I can now jump into the folder here and take a look at what's actually on this disk. Interesting. Um, not really what I expected. There's a bunch of batch files on here, and then like a bare bones DOS install, and nothing else. And that's interesting because when I launched this machine off of that disk, uh, it pulled up like a menuing system. So there's definitely no room for that on here. It must have been something on the C drive, unless it failed to read some files off the disk, but I doubt that. So let's go ahead and image the hard drive now. All right, how do we get this hard drive out? There's no access panel on the bottom for it. So I'm thinking, yeah, there's a screw here, and then this guy looks like it just flips out. Which makes me wonder what this access panel is for. It's not under where the hard drive goes. I can see, oh, okay, I can see the cable for the CD-ROM is available through there. Okay, so this is how we get the CD-ROM out. The CD-ROM is also kind of loose for some reason. Let me tighten these screws down. A fortunate thing, by the way, I'm in here and I'm not seeing any rust or water damage. Whatever it was that made the back panel rust like that seems to have been very localized. CD-ROM's nice and tight now. Let's go ahead and uh, see if we can get access to this hard drive. It's making me wonder now that I'm taking this apart, how is this one screw going to release this entire hard drive? Oh, it's a sled. Wow, this thing really is a Mac. Yeah, wow, there's a sled in there. Not only that, <laughs> but it's not seated correctly. It's a plastic tab here. Let me zoom in. So the hard drive is on a Macintosh style sled uh, where the plastic sled is screwed to the drive and the sled clips into the chassis. Good idea. Um, but for some reason, the sled has actually gone past the slot here that it should be clicked into. That's interesting. Uh, hmm, wonder how that happened. Okay, so I'm gonna wanna probably disconnect this before I pull it out, I guess. Wow, this thing is like, not really very painful to work on. I mean, I was scared at first, but uh, once I jumped in here, really not much to it. Bad. <laughs> so this was still being used in 1997, and it's a lot of it's a lot of nomenclature on here, a lot of scribbling, huh? So from that, I guess I'm going to anticipate that I'm going to get read errors when I try and uh, read this thing. Also interesting, this was installed in 1995 but the machine was made in 93. So this is this machine's second hard drive, at least, and this one failed, as well as the first one. That's not a great lifespan for these hard drives. Also, I don't recognize this hard drive. I've never seen this design before. I've seen a lot of hard drives of all ages, never seen this one. Maybe this is from a really bad period of IBM hard drive manufacturing, I don't know. Well, anyway, since it's a IDE, we'll be able to rip it fairly easily. I don't have a four pin Molex power supply right now. Um, I used to, but I don't know what happened to it. Uh, so I'm just gonna power it off the machine itself. Uh, I'll just hang it off the Molex here, which is interesting by the way, because the IDE cable plugs in right here, you know, so it's got this little dinky IDE cable, but then the power, rather than going back to the power supply, which I guess is in the, the rest of the chassis, it plugs into this uh, little four pin uh, floppy style connector that's on the motherboard which makes sense to route all the power through the motherboard. In fact, I can see, yeah, there's the, um, this is the connector for the uh, CD-ROM, and this is the one for the floppy drive. So the motherboard in this thing acts as a power distribution board. Makes perfect sense, uh, still very odd to see. This Big Mac box is not leftover food scrap. I cleaned it out with alcohol and I used it as a project box. See, there's some electronics in there. I don't know of a good way to do imaging on Windows uh, with hard drives. I, I think there must be a way to do it, um, but I'm not aware of like a simple free approach. And of course, the danger with Windows is just that it's really bad about not leaving things alone. Uh, I run it as my primary operating system, but you know, it's like living with somebody. You can love them all you want, but you know their flaws. If I plug a hard drive in here, Windows might decide to frob it, to, to do something with it, and I don't want anything to be done to the drive till I tell it to. So I'm going to use Linux. Okay, uh, well, this sucks. This is honestly a first for me. Um, the power connector is too wide for this guy 
to plug in. Never had that happen before. I think if I used a different Molex connector, I could do it. Wait a minute. Oh, there we go. There happens to be a cavity in the side of this adapter. And if you plug the adapter in first and then chase it with the Molex connector, <laughs> the wing goes into the cavity. There we go, got it. Well, that's a dumb solution to a dumb problem. All right, now I just turn on the power for this and we should see a hard drive show up here. Okay, there we go, it saw a partition. Okay, yep, that's a 516 meg disc. All right, and we'll just start copying that now. All right, well, despite it saying bad, that seems to have been completely successful. Um, got a 517 meg image. I guess I'll check and see if it mounts. And there we are, there's all my files. All right, terrific. So having preserved the data, I can now move on to play with the data. Maybe this hard drive will die, but uh, not too concerned about that. So at the moment, I'm just gonna go ahead and put this thing back the way it was, start it up the way it was intended to be used, and uh, we'll see what it does. I think I mentioned this earlier, but this machine has a lot of design elements that are kind of similar to Macs of the same era. Uh, like you'd open up a Performa or something and you'd find the same sort of situation. These plastic tabs and sleds and everything. And they were horrible there and they're kind of horrible here too. These tabs don't, don't really work. And I think uh, if I worked on this machine regularly, I'd probably just take them off. They don't actually retain it positively. They're just really irritating when you want to take it apart. Uh, what I am gonna do Actually, now that I think about it, before I put this thing back together, I am going to dust it, but also I'm gonna do something about this rust situation. I don't think it's gonna harm the machine, but it's really unpleasant and it could get worse. I can't really clean off, you know, all the cards or anything. I'd like to, because they're all kind of rusty, but I can at least pull out that blank and clean it up. If I can get this ISA card out, wow. Ugh. It is really in there. Oh, oh my God, whoa. There's another screw. Are you seeing this? There's a screw right there, which is retaining this card. These cards don't have that. That's weird. I've never seen that before. Who does that? I mean, IBM, I guess. The machine is not incredibly filthy, but it's not clean either. However, in addition, We've got like a, a spindler plastic situation going on here. Uh-oh, who's that? I thought I heard something rattling in here when I was first touching it. Hmm, wonder what that used to be. Uh, well, it would seem to correlate to this little tab here. Yep, yeah, just for whatever reason, there was a little, uh, little uh, plastic sort of snorkel hanging down there that I guess just pressed on the board to, I don't know, align it or something and it just came right off and I'm not sure how to get it out. Oh. This is of course the classic 3C509 3Com Etherlink 3. My God, if I've handled 300 of these cards in my life, no way, that's impossible, thousands. Uh, my God, I, I can't tell you how many of these cards I've handled. Oh man, this plastic is just crumbling as I try to pick it up. So I wonder, hmm, I wonder what that ever did. Can't really tell, it's got a, um, it's all broken off along this edge. It looks it looks almost like a retaining clip that you would have pushed on to release something, but I don't know what, and I don't see the remaining bits and pieces of it. Yeah, no, I, no idea what that was. I'm looking at this now, and I'm wondering to myself, why is there exactly one slot on here that has the extra retaining screw? I don't get it. Neither of these have it. This one doesn't have it. It's just this one. What was this? The rust pattern is not what I expected. I thought it was gonna be rusty all over, but it's just the exposed strip. Like, did someone just spritz the back of this? It didn't come as clean as I hoped on the wire wheel. Like there's still some, some stuff on there. And I thought to myself like, oh, maybe I'll uh, soak it in some rust remover or something. And then I had this brilliant brainwave. You dumbass. It's just an ordinary PCI bracket. You can just put another one on there, right? No, it's not ordinary. So I do actually have to make this one good. I guess I'll soak this in some rust remover at some point, but I don't have any, so it's just gonna go back on here for now. This ain't exactly hand tool rescue. Maybe that guy can send me some evapo rust. 
I'd love to clean more of the dust off of here. Like the air compressor did a good job, but like there's still there's still stuff, but I don't know what a safe way to do that is. I mean, I've got some chip brushes, but surely those aren't static safe, and I've never seen anybody suggest a solution for this. So, I'm just going to leave the dust on for now until somebody tells me a safe way to remove it. I should note, by the way, these are not normal threads for like your, your typical case screws. These are much finer. I suspect they're like the, uh, I don't know what thread it is that gets used for CD-ROMs, um, but I suspect it's that one. So of course, nothing on here is quite what you'd hope it would be. Not quite standard, not quite normal. Sort of the thing that's both great and sucks about weird systems like this is that on the one hand, you get to see stuff you haven't seen see new ways of doing things but on the other hand you get to see stuff you haven't seen new ways of doing things honest to god if someone can tell me how to safely dust out a machine like a feather duster that's not a huge source of static let me know so having done all that let's see if the floppy drive wants to behave wouldn't eject the disc earlier Ugh. Ugh. It feels really rough oh huh it's actually not ejected. I got the disc out, but it didn't actually engage. That must have a jammed linkage. I might be able to fix that. Oh, wow, that, that drive is really wedged in there. Like it's coming, but I got to wiggle it out. Just to pop the cable here, if I can do it without damaging anything. Oof. Wow. The floppy drive is rusty. Nothing else in here is really rusty. Now, most likely, there's just a linkage that's stuck in here due to being under lubricated. You know, the, the grease on it went bad. And if I can just get that loosened up, it'll probably solve the problem. With some of these, you just uh, pry the case off. But with this one, I did that and it, it wasn't coming. So I think it's these four screws here. The drive could be replaced. You know, I'm wondering to myself if there's anything special about it other than that that button. I feel like there's a good chance there is though, and it does seem to work still. So I'll still give it a shot. Okay, it's not exactly falling to pieces. You know, I pried the other side up. I might have to pry this one up in order to break the bond of the rust. Well, there's something more. There's something else holding it. Ah, the assembly of this thing is weird. There we go. Alright, so there's the bare drive. And something's not moving like it should be. I'm kind of not trusting this linkage right here. That kind of looks like maybe it should be moving. That one moves freely. Yeah, there's definitely a uh, there's some nasty grease under, oh, that's just glue. I think that's probably our culprit right there. Let's uh, push this up and then if we help this, can we get it to move? The tough thing about this is that I don't know what's supposed to actually move, but I've looked at every single part of it that I can see. And the only thing I see that looks like it ought to move, but I just can't get to move is this part right here. Oh, there we go. Okay, yep, yeah, that, there it is. That was the problem. This thing right here is just cemented in place. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it's just got grease on there and that grease has turned to glue. Ideally, I would take that out, but it, I think it's riveted in place, so I don't think I can take it out. What I can do is I can just drizzle some oil on it that will hopefully wash that grease out of there and uh, or at least loosen it up enough that it functions for the time being and I can deal with this some other time. It's been a long time since this made an appearance in a video. This is a, a little precision oiler. I can just go in here, just put a drop of oil on there and a drop there and a drop there. This isn't, sorry, this isn't oil. This is actually, um, what is it? CLK, I think it is. It's, uh, I think it's for cleaning guns actually. But it's just sort of a, just sort of a light oil, uh, kind of solvent mixture, and I found it's very effective for freeing up floppy drives, 
and uh, really just anything else. I put more on there than I probably should have. That's definitely moving freely for the moment. I don't know if it's going to work long term, but uh, that definitely, definitely got it working for now. Let's just validate here. I believe we'll find, put a disc in. There we go. These things are so simple that it really had to be something straightforward. The only way that I could really take that apart and clean it the way that you should to solve this problem would be to drill that rivet out and then put a stack of like a screw, two plastic washers and like a lock nut on the other side. And I don't have any of that stuff. And this is just a floppy drive. So I'm not gonna go out of my way that much. We're good, I'm gonna put this back together. Learned that trick from turntable repair videos on YouTube. Grease turns to glue over time. Oh, turns out the trick with this guy looks like is uh, these tabs here at the front have little notches. So if I slid this backwards, I probably could have separated these. Eh, the more you know. They were uh, ruthlessly committed to EMF shielding here. Wow. All right, this thing should be 100% ready to go now. Let's just get it back in its home, fire it up. Okay, that's the power connector. Let's just get this video connector in. There we go. That was really easy. Um, I was really anticipating a lot more trouble with this thing. Like I said earlier, I thought I was gonna have to take the whole uh, the whole chassis off, you know, get in with the, the CRT and, and have fun with that and everything. But uh, no, they made everything a nice compact package. I'm pretty impressed. I guess it makes sense given that these were educational machines, they probably wanted to be able to do maintenance on them pretty easily. I mean, especially given the fact that apparently this thing got two hard drive replacements in like three years. I've been curious about this all day, so I can't resist. I gotta find out if this screw is meant to be here, if there's a hole for it, or if it's just driven straight into the plastic. And you know what? Huh, it's just driven straight into the plastic. Oh no. So they weren't fooling around. Uh, this mouse holster is held on by the screw and by an adhesive foam pad. So actually taking it off is a huge pain. That is really, really hard to clean. It's ironic that they would put something in a school computer that is not designed to be cleaned. Children are nothing if not filthy. So I'm gonna be a very intelligent person and I'm gonna rotate this down on its side so that as I scrub the crap out of these slots up here, it doesn't fall down into the CRT. I've never really figured out how you're supposed to clean monitors because anything that you clean off the top is obviously going to get knocked down inside, but you got to do it. Otherwise they're disgusting. Kind of looks like somebody was doing finger paints over this. That's uncharitable. This was probably in a high school. Glad whatever the black dirt is is coming off. Usually when I see scuffs like that, they're uh, pretty much permanent.
Well, it doesn't look like it just rolled off the factory line or anything, but it does at least entirely work, and most of it looks good, except for, you know, the rusty plate on the back. And I also found out that uh, there's a spot on the front I thought was a blemish, and it's actually a crack in the bezel, so that's kind of a bummer. But it's not really very noticeable, so I'm pretty pleased with the visual condition of this thing. Uh, and the fact that everything seems to work, including the floppy drive now, uh, pretty happy with the acquisition, um, even though I paid way too much for it. If you ever wonder who drives up the prices on eBay, I can now tell you it's definitely YouTubers. I am very guilty now. Let's uh, turn it on and make sure it still works. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of it before I put it away and try and figure out what narrative I'm going to attach to this. Like I said, it takes normal PS2 keyboard and mouse. Uh, and I, I have some contemporary keyboards and mice, but they're all in really bad condition. So I'm just gonna use a normal modern one. Yeah, PS2, very modern. I just realized I forgot to do one thing while I was in there, which was reset the BIOS. But I'm not gonna do that yet anyway, because the only reason I wanted to do it was to clear the password that's on the BIOS itself, and that doesn't stop the machine from booting normally. And if I clear the BIOS, that could stop the machine from booting normally. So I'll just leave it for now. Sounds normal so far. And we have a picture. Okay, I wasn't able to pause it in time, but this thing actually uses a Phoenix BIOS and it makes sense for the time period. That was an interesting beep, but it's still really funny that IBM licensed someone else's BIOS for their own machines. I don't know if that's what all like the Aptivas and whatnot were using, but it is very funny. PSL DOS device driver microcode, PSL. I wonder what that is. All right, so uh, from the floppy, this thing boots up to the local science menu. I just went to adjust the contrast, so I thought I could maybe get you a better picture. Look at this. Rotate, 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 rotate. And if you look at the screen as I'm doing this, it goes down, then it goes up, then it goes down, then it goes up. This potentiometer behind here has lost its stops. Ooh, that sucks. Won't hurt anything, but it does, eh, does suck. Anyway, so the software on here is a PSL, um, several CDs uh, that you can call directly from here if they're in the drive, uh, BioLink, BodyWorks, Joint Education Initiative menu, which I'm guessing is like the administrative section. So we'll go check that out. And then this one here will launch uh, Windows 3.1, which in turn immediately tries to load stuff off a CD. So this whole machine was based around CD, except for this thing here, which I'll show you in a moment. I really wish this thing came with the CDs. If anybody has them out there, please send them to me. All right, so PSL is, I'm not super sure, but I think that this is experiment software that interacts with like a physical piece of hardware. I was messing around with this earlier a little bit, and if you hit select experiment, it offers you these like probably junior high topics. If you pick one, it gives you this nice medium resolution graphical interface. Looks like whatever this does is kind of neat, but, if I try to start this, it says, unable to open PSL communications. And I remember that during boot, it says it's loading a PSL device driver. So uh, I don't know if this was just a sort of client server thing where there was a, a, you know, a teacher's system this is trying to connect to, or if this is trying to connect to some sort of piece of hardware that actually performed the experiments. That seems surprising, but maybe. There's gotta be someone here that don't use that if that were the case. Like for instance, this one here, no, this also uses it, whatever it is. So yeah, I don't know what this thing does. I'm gonna have to research it. Anyway, if we just uh, start Windows here, it starts Windows. You know, given the color of the desktop, I'll bet this is running in a greater color depth than 16 colors, which is actually something I knew Windows 3 could do, obviously, but I haven't seen anything <laughs> that actually had a 256 color graphics driver for Windows 3 in a very long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's 256 colors. I think 16 colors looks a lot rougher than that. I could be wrong. Oh, yep, there we go. VGA 640 by 480, 256 colors. Cool. It also has network support installed directly in Windows. Oh, huh. I hadn't expected that. I knew it had the network card. I didn't know what they were doing with it. Netware. Oh, delightful. Maybe I should turn up a Netware server. Anyway, there's a bunch of software on here that's clearly uh, school related. Concepts in Chemistry, The Physical World, Chemicalc, and my guess is that every one of these links to a CD-ROM that I don't have. Although, I don't know, it does look like a bunch of these actually have 
icons, so maybe not all of them are dependent on the CD-ROM. Oh yeah, okay, Chemicalc 2.2 works. What about the physical world? That's That's got to be video for Windows setup. Yep, there we go, that's a CD-ROM program. There was a rash of educational software that had no reason to exist. It was just pretty much a book, but it came on a CD for no reason. And most of these are probably that, just, you know, images, text, maybe the occasional useless video clip. Cannot read from Drive L. Edit, model, run. This must be... Oh. Huh. This is a modeling program, but I have no idea what it's modeling. Conveyors. Think of a conveyor as a moving sidewalk. Material gets on the conveyor, rides, and then gets off. Leakage of conveyor contents is possible. Wow, I don't know if this is some sort of, like, logic modeling program or what. I also don't have the ability to open any files, so, like, if there were any examples saved on here, oh well. I see there's a whole samples folder here. Why can't I load these? Oh, because it had a doc open already. Ozone.stm. Wow, that is taking a while to load. Huh. This model contains advanced features that are not available in this version of the software. These features will be inaccessible. Well, it's not shareware, so I guess it must just be like a lower price point. The school must have bought the cheap version. Oh. Whoa. What? Is this like HyperCard? Whoa, this is really something. If CFC production were halted completely worldwide in 1998, what pattern do you think Ozone will trace? Sketch the pattern, then click the run button. So we can we can put our guess in there. Holy crap, that's slow. Why is that so slow? This machine's a 386, but it should be faster than this. A Mac on a, a 68K processor was faster than this. Okay, and now we can see what the reality will be. I think this thing is simulating it, but it's just really crawling. Wow, that's really something. I, I don't know why it's so slow. That's a fascinating program. I'm gonna have to come back and, and check that out later for sure. I don't really know what it does still. Anyway, Simulations Plus, Interactive Physics. These all look fascinating if any of these actually work without the CDs, and I think yeah, we just got Microsoft Works on here. I'm gonna put the hard drive contents and the floppy drive online. I'm sure I'll be able to run this stuff in like DOSBox. Uh, I just gotta scrub it first to make sure, you know, there's no obvious like personal identifying information in it. One last thing I'd like to point out uh, before I close here is just that uh, IBM customized this thing so that when you boot it up, it fades in the BIOS screen. Watch this. See that? That wasn't the CRT warming up. It actually fades in like that. And then, at the end of the post sequence, watch closely, it fades out again. How cute is that? They didn't need to do that, and I don't know why they did that. So yeah, that's a um, pretty cute machine. I'm not sure if it fills in the gap that I wanted to fill with the PS2 Model 25, because it is very large. I don't know if it looks that way in the video, but this thing is enormous. It's much bigger than I thought it was gonna be. So. As far as like serving the purpose I thought that would serve, I don't know if it necessarily will. Um, and if somebody comes up with a Model 25 with the 386 or a 486, I might actually be interested in selling or, or trading this thing if it's substantially smaller. But it's still a very cool machine. So I'm pretty pleased with that. And uh, I hope you had a good time watching this. If you liked this, please subscribe. And if you wanna help me get more stuff like this in the future, uh, consider subscribing to my Patreon. Uh, hopefully the next video I make about this thing will be a much more compelling argument for doing that. Thanks for watching.